Hey folks, it's Raina Jadif here, founder of HealCircle.org, on a mission to get you to live a longer, healthier life. And today, prepare to you have your mind blown because we've got David Sinclair in the house. Hi, David. How's it going? Thanks for having me on. Now, you're like a certified genius, right? So MIT, you're sitting at Harvard Medical School right now. You're a tenured faculty, which I know, having been to Harvard uh, Business School, is not that easy to get. And for those of you that are interested, you know, check out the show notes. We're going to have a list of David's incredible accomplishments. But today we're talking about Lifespan, the book that you've written. Um, you got a copy with you, David? Uh, you want I have to one show here that? in my office. Um, it looks so like why we age and why we don't have to, and you're going to tell us today why we got it all wrong, that uh -huh. aging's really a disease. So Let's get started at the beginning for those who haven't watched uh, your TED Talk. Uh -huh. And by the way, you haven't aged a day since your TED Talk in, what was it, 95, I think? So whatever you're doing is working. We're going to dive into that a little bit later. But let's start with that. Um, you believe that we got it all wrong. So what is aging? Uh, so thanks again, thanks again for having me on. The aging is, uh, by medical definition, uh, something that happens over time to cause disease and disability, but it ha happens to 50% or more of us. And that's the, by any other definition, it would be a disease, something that causes us to be frail and eventually die. That's a disease. But the difference is, and it's totally arbitrary, that doctors have de defined it at that 50%. So if, it, if something terrible happens to 49.9% of us, disease. 51% aging. And that arbitrary cutoff has made a huge difference that we've, we've tackled individual diseases one by one, but we haven't tackled the thing that actually causes most of those diseases, which is aging. It's like a super disease, isn't it? It's the container for all diseases. What causes aging? Uh, well, that's been debated, but the, the good news is that we finally have a handle on why we age. Now, at one level, you can say there are about eight major things that go wrong in our body. And so viewers and listeners may know about telomere shortening, the ends of chromosomes, mitochondria, so we lose the little battery packs in the cells, uh, stem cell loss, senescent cells, so cells that get old and turn into zombie cells in our body. The list goes on. And about 10 years ago, we scientists we declared victory over aging. We said there are eight of these hallmarks of aging, as we call them. Uh, but what actually bothered me was that that doesn't explain why they all happen. Is there something upstream, as we say, that causes all of those? Is there a major uh, spring that leads to these tributaries? And if we can dam up the spring, we don't have to build eight dams on eight tributaries. And in my book, I'm proposing for the first time um, to the public that I think we've identified what that upstream cause is. And what is it? Uh, you sure you want me to go into it? No. What, yes. what is it that is in here? Well, so what, what I'm proposing um, and explaining uh, why we should do, be doing certain things in our life, why actually our longevity is in our hands, uh, is that aging, when you boil it down, is a loss of information. That's all it is. In the same way that if we have a corrupt phone or a corrupt computer, uh, things get screwed up. Um, but what's the good news is, is that now that I think we understand aging, we can have a, a reset button. There's a backup hard drive in our bodies uh, or a reset on the phone that we can do. And so I want to talk about that later. But... What is this information, you may ask? Well, we've all heard of genetic information, okay? The DNA in our cells. Uh, that's the digital part of our bodies. Um, instead of zeros and ones, we have four letters, four chemical letters in our DNA strung end to end. Each cell has six feet of that chemical, um, and it's ACTG. I think everyone knows about that. But what isn't talked about as much, but it's just as important for life and health, are the regulators of our genes. We call this the epigenome. And that's just a fancy word for what are the systems in our cells that turn one gene off and the other gene on. And we need this epigenetic information to tell each cell 
what to do and what type of cell it is. Because all of our cells have the same DNA, but all of our cells are not the same. We have cells that make skin, cells that make brains. And it's the epigenome that, that does that. And the, this information is laid down when we're very young. And it allows us to be healthy when we're young, in our 20s and somewhat in our 30s. But what I'm proposing and what we've shown in my lab is that it's the loss of that epigenome, that information that we have when we're young, that leads to aging and all the diseases that come with it, heart disease, Alzheimer's, frailty. And we can drill down into what that actually means at a molecular level. It's not that complicated. Um, why don't I do that now? So the, the DNA is not just floating around in the cell. What turns genes on and off is that genes that are looped around and, and exposed to the water are on and genes that are bundled up tightly, like you would a hose on a driveway, those are genes that are off. But over time, what we find is that, particularly by DNA damage and broken chromosomes, the, the hose reel starts to unravel and genes that should be off for our lifetime start to come on. And we think that makes cells uh, less functional and eventually they either senesce, so they become zombie-like, mm -hmm. or they just sit there and they're not functional. And the good news is that we think there's a backup how to restore all of those nice loops and those bundles back to being young again. So we're going to talk about the restoration process a little bit later. I want to dive still a little deeper into the why, right? If you look at what's happened in the last couple of decades, um, we used to age in a certain curve. Sort of everyone, you know, merrily went along and then suddenly your kind of 30s hit and some of the pains get started and then you hit your 40s. And, you know, the belly starts to protrude and the hair starts to gray and you get to your 50s and you begin the process of getting diagnosed with a disease. Like to me, it's been this curve. You get to 60s, you get more decrepit, you get to 70s. Now you're at sort of your tail end and, you know, 75, you're, you're dead on an average. In the last few decades, David, this curve's accelerated where we're starting to see people like me getting diagnosed with cancer in the 30s not 60s, because cancer used to be an old person's disease, like heart disease. We're starting to see it in the 30s. We're starting to see multiple sclerosis diagnosis in the 30s. Um, HealCircle.org, we get incoming from patients all day long. And it's, you know, my 28-year-old just got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So we're starting to see this acceleration of aging. What ages us? What is it that turns these DNA cells on and off? Well, it's actually very simple. Um, we have protective genes in our body. We call them longevity genes. And the ones that I work on uh, have a special name. They're called sirtuins. Um, but there's this, this group of genes that uh, we can turn on by living the right lifestyle. Mm. But unfortunately, today's increasing uh, sedentary lifestyle, uh, obesity, lack of exercise, um, and even the things that we're exposed to such as DNA damaging agents, these accelerate the aging process and our bodies become complacent. You know, we, we, we like to feel safe and, and not exert ourselves and not be hungry. And we live a life now where we don't have to run ever. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go hungry usually ever. Um, and these are the worst things because they turn off our body's defenses against deterioration. And it makes perfect sense because we evolved, our bodies are meant to be under adversity that's how the life was it's so counterintuitive though right david you would think that we would want the bodies to be resting more and not be pushed and it's good that our temperature we can control it now and have it at 72.5 if that's the temperature we desire and that we can eat food anytime we want because we have Absolutely. a pantry and a bird stock. You'd think that those would be the things that would make us live longer. You're telling us, uh-uh, it's the exact opposite. You gotta stress your body. Yeah. Why? Well, Why do we need to stress our bodies to make them live longer? Well, so the term that we use is called hormesis and that, that means anything that doesn't kill you actually makes you stronger and longer live. And the reason that, that our bodies are set up that way is that we can't always be fighting disease um, because that's a trade-off. The body likes to use energy for other things uh, like 
dividing cells, making your skin grow really fast and reproducing. So it's a trade-off. What are you going to do with the food you have? You can either grow fast and multiply or build a stronger body. Mm. And if there's a lot of food around and we're not exercising, the body says, hey, I don't need to defend the body. I just need to do this other stuff. And it'll, it, it will divert all your energy into non-survival mechanisms. But if you, if you run for 10 minutes a day and, or are hungry during the day, you'll actually get your body to put more, more effort into defending against diseases um, and protecting you against the, all those hallmarks of aging that I was describing. Um, and so really a, a little bit of adversity mm. in, your, in your body goes a long way. Uh, it, I often ask people how long do they want to live and it depends on people's age. Young people sometimes say 80 or 100. People who are already 100, you know, obviously they, they want to keep going. They love life. And so it depends. Uh, but when I tell people that based on this science, people will be healthier in their 90s and beyond, then everybody wants that. So mm -hmm. people aren't afraid of dying. They're afraid of losing their humanity. Exactly. And so that's what we're talking about today is being healthier for longer. And guess what? If you don't get a lethal disease, you tend not to die, right? That's the, that's the fact. So our research is based on extending the period of health. Uh, and the lifespan comes as a byproduct of that. So that's the good news. We're, we're talking about doing things today and developing medicines of tomorrow that keep people productive, able to start new careers. My father at 80 just started a new career and feels like he was 20. And wow. we're keeping people out of nursing homes. And that's what I think is going to be great for families and the, the economy as well. Have we figured out if there is a number? You know, there's a number that I've read. One well, we can put a number on it. There's, there's, no, there's no law that says we have to die at 80. There are okay. many species like whales. No, it's not coded in our DNA. There's no DNA coding which says you must die by 150. Like no. there's no expiration date on us. No, and there are no aging genes. Genes are not causing us to age. We have protective genes that we need. See, that's to fascinating. So we're not designed to age is what you're saying. No, we're just at the whim of, uh, of information loss in the same way that you can lose an email. Our bodies are the same. Uh, okay. So is, if we're doing all the right things in life, we're preserving our cellular function, okay. the, the epigenetic information, as I call it, for much longer, and then they can fight diseases. Um, you know, young people typically, they don't get cardiovascular disease or Alzheimer's because their bodies can fight it. Um, and if we stay young, we don't get sick typically. So it's all about keeping your body's information loop young. Exactly. So there's two things, right? Well, what creates the aging of that information loop? Why are we losing, right? You, you, the example you give is it's the scratches on those old records, yeah. right? So now the needle's skipping. So we're not hearing the full song. Right. We're, we're skipping parts of the song and that's what's creating the aging. What's making my needle skip? Mm -hmm. What creates that friction in the information loss? Yeah, good question. This is what we've been working on for 20 years and I finally revealed uh, in my book. And that is that there are a number of ways to disrupt these loops and packages of our DNA. And the most effective way to do that, if you want to age fast, is to break your DNA. Uh, a broken chromosome is a disaster for a cell. It'll die if it doesn't fix it. And in the panic of trying to ligate and glue back the DNA, these loops and these structures, these bound up loops, um, they actually become unraveled, which is a good thing initially, but once you've fixed the chromosome and joined the DNA back together, then you have to put it all, package it back together. The loops have to go back to being loops and the packages have to go back to being packages. If you don't do that over time, as I mentioned, it's like scratches on a record or scratches on a CD. The cell can't read the right genes at the right time and cells lose their ability to function. And mm -hmm. that is aging. Do you think to some extent this device right here and our laptops and all this frequency that's coming at us and potentially 5G, which has been banned in a couple of nations, including Israel. Do you think this is partly to blame for some of the information loss? 
Uh, well, I think that radiation in general is bad if it, if it disrupts uh, these loops. And it, it's unclear, nobody's ever studied uh, that kind of thing. So what I'd love to know is, does 5G cause a cell to get older faster? We can oh. test that in my lab, within, we could know it within a week. Well, the, the reason that, that my theory is, is important here is that if you just think that aging is caused by um, mutations leading, uh, or, or if, if the only thing you're worried about is cancer, then you'll miss the effects on aging. Right. If, so, you know, if you take um, most radiation emitting devices, whether it's a scanner at the airport or, or an x-ray machine, they'll test that on, on animals and, and ask, does it cause cancer, yes or no? And if it doesn't, then it's all good, right? It's not mm -hmm. cancer causing. But as my book explains, that's only half of the problem that you need to look at. The other half is aging can be accelerated. And in my lab, we've tested this idea. We've deliberately cut chromosomes in, an, in a mouse. And guess what happens to them? They get what? old. They, they get 50% older than their brothers and sisters. So broken chromosomes and disrupting these loops definitely causes acceleration of the aging clock. And we need to look harder at whether devices that emit radiation can accelerate aging and nobody's looking. Well, well I'm, I'm pretty nervous about x-rays. Um, I know they're important, but sometimes they're used uh, overzealously. For example, I think my dentist overuses x-rays um, and I, I'm not sure if it's to pay for the machine they bought or what, but uh, I tried to refuse to get an x-ray because I know what x-rays do to aging it's clear to me that they accelerate the clock. And when I refused, they said, no, you have to do it. There's no question. I was forced into getting an x-ray over my own will. Um, and I talk about this in the book that um, as, as much as we need and love the medical community, there are some practices that need to be revised and, and re-examined. So x-rays is one. And I think for women, especially with the mammograms, that's a big one. Are there other areas in the medical field that, that worry you that actually create aging? Like, what about meds? What about all the pharmaceutical drugs? Right. Well, these are drugs are typically used to save people's lives. The one that I'm going to mention would be Dr. Rubison. A lot of the, the cancer treatments, the chemotherapies, uh, are intentionally damaging DNA mm -hmm. and breaking chromosomes in their effort to selectively kill the cancer cells which divide very quickly and are susceptible to these drugs. But we now know that that accelerates aging in the rest of the body. The same way these mice that I mentioned, we can damage their chromosomes and accelerate aging. The same happens to patients that get chemotherapy. Now that's important because you, you know, if without chemotherapy, you, you might die. So it's, it's a life-saving treatment, but the side effect is pretty horrible too. It increases the chance of future cancers and it leads to accelerated aging. So I would love to be able to find ways to prevent and treat cancer without damaging the DNA. Mm -hmm. And so there are some new, new avenues. So immunotherapy seems yes. to be pretty promising. So that could be um, an area that hopefully one day does away with what are fairly barbaric drugs. You talk about metformin a lot. Do you actually think that that's a drug that can uh, help? And I think you, you take it. Talk a little bit about metformin. Uh, sure. Well, so metformin has been used for uh, now about 40 years to treat uh, type 2 diabetes. So that's the age-associated diabetes, obesity-associated. And it really means that your body isn't responding to the insulin, that your, your body's telling your body, take up sugar in your blood, uh, which accelerates aging. And actually, your blood sugar levels are quite predictive of how long you'll live. The, the higher it is, the worse you have for your outlook. Oh, interesting. So you want to keep your blood sugar levels um, in the normal range and not spike. Mm -hmm. And that's true for during the day. It's also true for your lifespan. Uh, and so I, I monitor my blood levels now, actually. Oh, wow. Have a, uh, a little device under here. Okay. Um, can you see it under there? Yeah. Yeah, what is it? So it's a little patch that can measure my blood sugar throughout the day. Um, what is it called? Um, well, it's a brand. Uh, it's called Freestyle. 
I want to get one of those. Okay. And so you can see my my sugar there. Ah. Yeah. So I, I scan my arm. Okay, scan complete. My blood sugar is 84. And uh, you can see it's heading down. I, I need to have some lunch potentially. Okay. It's, now, uh, it's time to eat. And the red was low because um, I didn't have breakfast. Actually, I didn't have time to have breakfast. I had to run to give a lecture to medical students. Um, I didn't even shave today. But uh, I did have a shower, if you're wondering. But <laughs> anyway, what, what's important, really, is that this device here tells me how I individually respond to food. Not you, not an average human, but my microbiome, the, the bacteria in my gut, my age, my genetics. And I'm learning things about myself. Um, these patches sit for two weeks, so you get a lot of information. I found that white rice is terrible, grapes are terrible, and things that I thought would be terrible actually aren't that bad. Eating potatoes oh. doesn't spike my sugar, right? And uh, and so that that's the future, actually. Is um, I know it seems sci-fi because we're not used to it, but um, I'm trying to push the limits of technology. I, I monitor my sleep with my ring, my, mm -hmm. my heart rate. Or a ring, yeah. You know, one of these um, <laughs> watch is helpful, but yeah, I really want to learn and tell people about what I'm learning. Um, Hopefully, this stuff isn't aging you while you're trying to not age, right? Right. That's, I know that's what you mean. Uh, I think this one's pretty low. low that one's low. Yeah. But the watch, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm well, not sure. I so I, I didn't buy one. Uh -huh. Yeah. Fair enough. I'm still worried. I'm. I'm well, just, I, I didn't get the one that that actually has a. A radio signal. Gotcha. And how long have you been doing this experiment? Or is this a lifestyle for you now? Is this something that you just wear, like you wear your shirt, you wear your patch? Well, I've only started over the last three weeks. I've been learning a lot, but I love it. Um, I didn't think I'd enjoy it this much. It feels weird, right? When you hear about it, what do you, you've got a sensor in your body that's strange, but you get used to it very quickly and it becomes part of your routine. It's, oh, I'm feeling a bit dizzy. Let me just check. Oh yeah, I, I need to have something. Or, wow, I just ate something. I wonder what that's doing to my body. Check, oh wow, that, that, I'm not gonna eat that again in a hurry. Um, and it, you learn what's good and what's bad very quickly rather than what you just hear about for the average human. That is to me the future. Personalized, truly personalized medicine is the future. Yes, I have, I have a chapter in my book about it. and the. The idea that we go to the doctor once a year for an annual checkup will seem medieval. It already does, actually. The future is you, your body will know when something is wrong years before a tumor is detected or diabetes is, is exactly. almost there. And so I, I use a, a company called Inside Tracker, which I, ha I have invested a bit of money and not much, but that's into full disclosure. But So I've got 10 years of uh, data on my body and what's changing over time. And every time it goes, for me, slightly above optimal, uh, I get artificial intelligent um, recommendations on how to bring that back based on food and my genetics. Nice. And it's been great in making sure that I don't age. Oh, nice. And that's called Insight Tracker? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're going to check that one out too, because that sounds like, again, something that uh, a lot of our viewers and readers are going to be very interested in. So we've talked about, you've talked about cold as something that the body really loves. What about food? How much should we be eating? Go back a thousand years, um, even 2000 to Hippocrates. Uh, it was common knowledge that uh, fasting was good for us. And as consumers uh, and companies were you know, motivated to make us eat more, uh, we were taught and marketed at um, so that we would eat three meals a day and snacks in between. And you know, you turn on TV and that's what everyone's saying. You gotta eat all the time. Uh, and that's a great way to sell a lot of products, but it's also harmful. Uh, and we've shown in my lab and in, in hundreds of labs actually around the world that you need, you, you don't wanna always be hungry uh, uh, full. You wanna be hungry some part of the day. And as long as you're not starving or you're malnourished, it's actually very beneficial. Now it's different if you have a disease. If you have type one diabetes or or some other metabolic condition, that's def different. Talk to your doctor about that. But people like us who have regular metabolism, 
eating three meals a day, I think is the worst thing you can do. Um, your body will eventually uh, just become complacent, not turn on the body's defenses. And uh, so you can actually uh, feel pretty good by, by being hungry during the day. And we've shown in many different species from mice to dogs to monkeys that being hungry in the long run is very good for you. And it's not just about what we eat, right? But it's also when we eat. Mm -hmm. So you, for example, talk about how you don't normally have breakfast. By the way, I don't either. My entire life, I struggled with not wanting to have breakfast, but being forced to have breakfast, whether initially it was by my mom who said, what do you mean? You can't leave the home without having, you know, these eggs and milk and the rest of it, you know, oatmeal. Uh, and I remember feeling nauseous and sick in the morning because it's just, that's just not what my body type is. I wasn't designed to eat in the morning. And then again, there's people who wake up starving, like my little one, who's, I say little one, she's 15. Um, you know, she needs to eat. She wakes up and she's starving. She's, um, that's where I like the Ayurvedic body types because they, they do a good job of saying, hey, if you're a pitta, you're going to wake up hungry and you should eat. But if you're a vata, which is what I am, you're probably not interested in eating first thing in the morning and your metabolism gets going closer to around noon. And that's when, so I get famished between noon to four. I'm just feasting. I get so hungry. I'll go through 2000, 3000 calories without a blink. Like it's insane how much I can take in, but then I'm done at six and I really can't eat after six. I'm just yeah. full. What, what, what I've learned but that, that I think is really fascinating. Um, by monitoring my blood, I can see why I don't want to eat in the morning. Ah. I have a body type where just as I'm waking up in the morning, I, my body makes its own sugar. Oh. Yeah. So I don't yeah. need to eat. It's crazy. And, and I, my mother would also force me to eat breakfast when I was quite, my body was making its own food. So, you know, that's, uh, we have to learn that we all have different body types. That honoring ourselves, not listening to every stimulus out there, every ad, every commercial, every study, but really going inside and listening and honoring what your body is saying to you, I think is just the most important step one in getting to greater health. At least that's been my insight. Does it matter whether we finish our dinner by six or by 10? Uh, you don't want to eat late at night. Um typically because the, the period of fasting that's beneficial uh, will extend through the night. And uh, I'm, I'm prone to snacking late at night. Uh, it's, it's stress uh, really for me, but I try not to. I try to finish eating around eight o'clock at night. Some people try it earlier, uh, but that's, it's good for me because I skip breakfast. And so that gives me that whole 18 hours of, uh, of not eating a lot. Is that the magical number, 18 hours? Well, there is no magic number. Um, I think that probably it's, it's important to, to go without one meal a day, uh, either evening or morning, so you get that long sleep cycle. But, uh, you know, honestly, that we, we debate this all the time about which is the best diet. And some people say fast for three days, fast for a week, two days a week, 18 hours. We really don't know, but what I can tell you, it's similar to exercise, that doing nothing is the worst you can do. Right. Do a little goes a long way. What's the minimum period of fasting that's truly a fast? Oh, gosh. Uh, that, it's, it's a spectrum, but I, I would think, if you force me, it's more than 12 hours. Okay. Because we know that we don't eat during the night, and... Uh, so the average person has always fasted for 12 hours a day, uh, typically. And that doesn't give you more than an average life. So you need to go beyond that. So I, I try to do 18. Okay. This drug metformin is probably the first that we can definitively say that it also slows down aging itself. That's a huge statement. Is this something so, that you take every day? I, I do. I, well, I try to. It's actually, it can be harsh on the stomach of about 40% of people. So I actually, I, I tend to take it every day, but sometimes when I'm not feeling well, I don't. Um, but typically I would take it 500 milligrams in the morning 
and 500 milligrams at night. And, and what else do you take? Um, I take, uh, the, I mean, there's a, there's a bit of a list. So turn to page 302 of my book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me put it this way. If you could only take the three things on that very long list, metformin would be one, I'm assuming. What would be the other two? Uh, so resveratrol, the molecule from red wine, I've been taking that for over 10 years and that's been very good to me. My cardiovascular system remains like a 30 year old or less. And then the third one is called an NAD booster. And uh, the one that I take, there's a few different types. The one that I take is called NMN. Don't confuse that with M&Ms. That will not make you live longer. <laughs> uh, so M NMN is short for uh, a chemical called nicotinamide mononucleotide. It's really just a chemical that the body uses to make NAD. Uh, so what's NAD? You I'm sure, Renee, you want to ask that? Yes. NAD is a chemical that's used by the body in its chemical reactions, but also uh, its levels go down as we get older and we need it. But even, even just as important, if not more important for aging, is that the protective enzymes that we call the sirtuins, the ones that stabilize our, our loops of DNA, the ones that um, make sure we don't get the scratches on, on the CD, these enzymes, they need NAD to work. And as we have less and less NAD, they don't work. Right. And if we sit around and we get obese, if we get diabetes, if we don't exercise, NAD levels will go even further down. And so I take NMN as a way to keep those levels high, like I was young, and to augment the effects of exercise and fasting. What about NAD directly? I know that you can get that as well. Yeah. So I don't know enough about it to, to be intelligent. In fact, I would argue that nobody knows for sure, okay. but there's a lot of people trying it. Uh, I hear about it um, and I'm looking forward to clinical trials. It's typically used for treating drug addiction and increasingly for aging. Um, and I know it's given either IV or intramuscularly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's got, a chance of working the same way as the molecules that I take, uh, that NMN and other people take in R is a, is a similar molecule. Okay. But I, I, I wish I could say more. What I, I need to do is to do some research and then report out in my newsletter about what I learned. That'd be fantastic. Well, we're all going to be subscribing to it, keeping up with what you've been up to. Let's talk about resveratrol. So you're the original genius that found it and found how amazing it was in helping us with anti-aging and then boom um there was a lot of controversy around it whether it really worked or didn't work mm -hmm. you're back into getting some new data tell us all what what's the update on it does it work does it not work yeah okay so the the story just in case uh, you were living on the moon for the last 20 years um was that resveratrol from red wine this plant molecule that you find in grapes um, was thought and still is thought to be a healthy molecule and you can um, have a glass of red wine every day and it's thought to protect you against cardiovascular disease. Now we came upon resveratrol in the early 2000s because it turns out it activates the sirtuins, these defense enzymes that I was just talking about. And uh, we fed it to, first of all, we fed it to yeast that makes bread. So we fed it to yeast and worms and flies and mice, and mice on a Western diet, and they lived a lot longer. And then when we got rid of the sirtuin genes, they didn't, it didn't work. So we said, okay, we've got a molecule that can mimic fasting, can mimic exercise, turn on the sirtuins, and you get the benefits. And mice that are eating a high fat diet were as healthy as those that were eating a lean diet. And this news went around the world in 2006, and red wine sales went up 30% and stayed up. Um, but then in 2010, uh, Pfizer and Amgen uh, scientists put out two papers that said that we were wrong, that resveratrol didn't work through these sirtuin enzymes and that it was probably something else, something that, that would invalidate our patent, by the way. We've been working uh, diligently since then to ask the question, does resveratrol work through this mechanism by turning on the body's longevity genes? Uh, and the answer actually is 100%, uh, we were right. We have 
published a paper in the journal Science, which is arguably the, the, the leading journal in this country here. And uh, we showed that, yes, it's true that resveratrol activates these longevity enzymes. But we've, we've gone further, and I haven't published it yet, but I'll tell everybody about it. We've gone so far as we've, we've changed one amino acid in a mouse so that resveratrol doesn't activate this enzyme, this sirtuin enzyme. And now we can run the experiment again and ask, without this amino acid in this protein called SIRT1, does resveratrol extend lifespan mm. when the mice are given a Western diet? And the answer is not ambiguous. You absolutely need this enzyme to live longer when you take resveratrol. So Pfizer and Amgen were wrong. Uh, we were right. Uh, and I'm not gloating, but I, I do find it disturbing that companies can basically derail an entire field of research for a decade or more. Um, and it was, it's really quite sad because there were drugs that were showing efficacy working in human trials, and they were stopped because of this. Let's translate everything that we've been talking about into action. So there is a 50-year-old who's already showing signs of aging and loss of information with respect to whether it's prediabetes, obesity, hormonal uh, imbalance, hair loss, eyesight, vision, you know, all the different signs that the body gives you very clearly saying you're aging babe what can someone like that start to do immediately today to potentially turn back the clock right well so we can measure the clock by the way i could take your blood today and i could tell you when you're going to die where do i send you the sample uh well it's research purposes so i, I could but i'm not going to do that um we, How do we get you to make that into a commercial product? Because David, that's something that I think everybody would buy. Everybody would want to have access to this clock, which tells you, because then we can monitor, right? I'm a big believer in when you can track something, you can monitor it, you can improve it. Now you've got the motivation to improve it. Yes. Uh, so put it this way. I'm an entrepreneur. I, I, I hear you and I'm working on it. Thank you. Yeah. Timeline? Yeah. Not to be pushy or anything. Uh, so we, I've started a, a company called Iduna, which works on the clock and reprogramming the body to be young. Uh -huh. And uh, I've started this with uh, my good friend, Steve Horvath, who co-discovered this clock. And so we, you know, stay tuned if we have some things to figure out, but the goal is that we'll be able to measure anybody's clock. And we're working on bringing the price down right now it's probably close to a thousand dollars to be able to do this. So it's not for everybody, but I'm hoping to bring the price down to $5 a test. Please keep us in the loop because we've got a very large community that I know would love to be part of, especially if you go out and do some market testing or pilot testing. Yeah. Definitely keep us Okay, in good, we'll, we'll stay in touch. Now by measuring that clock, Steve Horvath and his colleagues have discovered that people who have certain lifestyles have a different rate of aging. Now we're all aging, even young teenagers have a clock that's ticking away. It actually starts at conception, which is a, a fascinating thought. Um, those people who have exercised and stayed lean have a slower clock. And those who have not done those things or smoked or had chemotherapy are on this faster trajectory. So what does that mean? It means that uh, we can affect this clock. And in fact, 80% of our longevity is in our own hands because it's epigenetic, it's not genetic. And that these loops, we can change those loops, we can reinstate those loops and we can slow the scratches down. So if I could say one thing you could do to slow the rate of aging right now, um, it's lose weight and eat less often. The other would be to get on a treadmill or climb stairs, get out of breath for at least 10 minutes every few days a week if you can, or even just once a week. A little bit of breathlessness goes a long way. Uh, and there are, there are, then there are other interesting things that I do. I, I eat a lot of plants. Uh, we've discovered that there are molecules in plants besides resveratrol that are healthy. And we actually think that these molecules are signaling to our body to turn on these natural defenses. We call it xenohormesis, X-E-N-O, hormesis. Remember, hormesis is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, Xeno means from other plants and other species. And by eating plants that are colored and stressed, and by stressed I mean they've been picked when they're dehydrated or 
too much sun or or organic foods they're typically more stressed than those that are in um, under under pesticides those give us those molecules that i think uh, add to the other things that i mentioned where do we buy the right resveratrol in the right concentration uh, so it, I actually, I don't know because I don't follow the supplement industry. Um, Where do you get yours? Yeah, I, I got mine from the clinical trials. <laughs> I have, a, I have a, a, a bucket of it in my basement. Ah, okay. Yeah, you know, what can I say that's fair? I don't want to endorse anybody because most of these companies are unfairly using my name anyway. Um, what should we look for in a label? How about yeah. that? Right, so I, I give away a lot of these secrets uh, in my book. Um, I, I'm not saying that because I want everyone to rush out and buy it, but there's a lot in there that I put that I can't say on air. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's in there and listed and sometimes in the end notes. Um, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor at Harvard University. I'm not selling anything. That's right. But there's, there's a, again, page 302, I think it is. It's all, it's all there, including the type of yogurt that I eat in the morning with my resveratrol little spoonfuls. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you should look for with supplements in general is uh, a trusted brand. Um, so it might be a, a um, I won't say a brand name, but there are some big companies that would be out of business by now if they broke the rules. Uh, also look for what's called a GMP, Good Manufacturing Procedures. And this is, a, I think, a a really important thing because if you're not using good manufacturing procedures uh, you might be uh, you know, contaminating your equipment that kind of thing so that's good and also look for high quality high grade materials so resveratrol comes in you know, sometimes just 50 percent pure i would avoid those because they have contaminants some of those contaminants can cause diarrhea and you know that's that's you know just one of the least of your problems if you have contamination. So high grade, greater than 98% GMP and uh, brands that have been around for a while and people trust. So th those are my best tip, uh, tips for uh, finding supplements that work. Now, I'm sure people are gonna ask me, what about NAD boosters? I take NMN. It's more expensive on the market than NR. NR is a version of NAD boosters. Both of them, provide improvements in health in mice. And we just don't know the effects in humans just yet. So, you know, if you wanna be on the cutting edge, you know, that's your decision. I've chosen to take the risk. I know what's gonna to happen to me in 20 years if I don't do anything. So that's what I'm weighing up. But NR, um, I don't think I can say superior to NMN. At this point, we don't know enough. No one's done a head-to-head -head human trial. Um, NR has been shown uh, to potentially provide benefits to ALS patients, Lou Gehrig's disease, it used to be called. Mm -hmm. And so that's some early evidence that we're onto something important here. But we do need more studies and I'm doing those. And I, I'm gonna report out those clinical studies as soon as I'm able to. What's the big question that you're working on answering right now in your lab? Uh, we're going for the big one. Uh, can you reset the body? Uh, can we take that clock way back? Not just a little bit, not just slow it down, but truly reset the body to find the backup hard drive and restore the software of our bodies so that we could literally be 20, 30 years younger than our actual age based on our candles on our birthday cakes. And how far away you think you are from getting an answer to that? Uh, well, we found the backup drive in animals, in mice. It wasn't that hard. We have found that there are genes that we can turn on in the animal and restore the age of the eye, for example. Wow. Yeah. And, and where is this backup driver? What is it called? What did you find? Well, so this, I, I wrote the book while we were making these discoveries um, over the past year. And uh, it's unusual. You won't find this in any other book or really any other website. It's all in there because we made the discovery recently. And what we found was that by turning on these three youth genes, we could reset that, um, that Horvath clock, that um, that clock that I mentioned. And that actually gets the loops and the bundles of DNA back to being youthful again. And when we treated mice that either had a damaged optic nerve 
or mice that had glaucoma, which is damage from pressure in the eye, or just plain old old mice, one-year-old mice, all of, all of those three uh, ended up uh, restoring large parts of their uh, function of their eye. And I have to be careful. Um, in the case of the old mice and the glaucoma mice, they got their vision back. Wow. Uh, and the old mice could actually see as well as young mice again. And uh, when we looked at the, the nerves at the back of the eye in the retina, the age of those nerves went backwards and the loops and the, the bundles, that went back to a youthful, uh, what we call gene expression. To put it another way, we polished the scratch CD and now the cells could read the genes, read the symphony again and restore their function. So that's really great news. That means that our bodies are probably still young in terms of their genetic information. And if we can scratch or remove the scratches, then uh, all that information comes back again to be young. And that truly really is the, the fountain of youth, right? That a lot of us who've gone through health crisis and that's you know a significant portion of us or are suffering right now a chronic disease or are suffering the ill effects of aging. I know we're all looking to find a way to get back into our youth when uh, you know you could jump out of bed without aches and pains and you could eat a lot of stuff and not gain uh, belly weight and you could drink and not have hangovers. And so um, very excited to see what you come out with next. Any parting advice as we wrap up? Oh, sure. Um, so I, I poured everything I know and feel into my book. So when you read my book, you're basically getting access to what's in here over 25 years of research and, and experience and emotion and family experience. My father, my wife, even my dogs have been trying things. And my father is now 80 and he's running around and feeling like he's 20, 30 years old. This is no joke. He wow. will admit this. And he wasn't like that 10 years ago. He was more like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. He was pretty depressed. And he started a new career. He's traveling the world. Uh, we recently got back from seeing gorillas in Uganda. Oh, and we were with his five grand grandkids. Oh. And afterwards he said, you know, David, this is what longevity, what your research is about. It's being 80 and being able to hang out with your grandkids and do the important things in life with them. And later that day, my kids, I would almost bring the tin in my eye. Uh, my kids said, uh, you know, dad, this is what it's about that uh, your fa you get to spend time with your grandfather and do the things you always wanted to do with him at 80. And I, I want this for everybody. I want everyone to be in their 80s and 90s, maybe one day beyond, um, in a healthy, productive way, uh, and spend the, the meaningful moments with their grandkids and great-grandkids and impart all the wisdom and history that's, uh, that's lost when everybody dies. That's beautiful. So... Aging is optional. Aging can be cured by the book. It's an awesome book. David, show the book again. Um, and make sure, you, make sure you turn to the end. I, I spent some time doing some drawings of the cast of characters that are in the book. If you can see those. It's incredible. Very proud of those. David, the closet artist. Um, oh, thanks. Anyway, so these were life-size drawings that ended up being postage stamps in the book. Um, and there's also glossary. So those of you who haven't done biology in a while, you can just turn to the back and it explains each one of the, these words uh, that I use. What's an amino acid? What's DNA? What's mutation? And so anybody can read it. My 12-year-old son has read it. Um, he, by the way, he wants to take over from where I left off. He's in the book. Um, nice. Yes. So this is um, a, a passion project of mine. It took me 10 years to get it all down on paper. Brilliant. David, it's just such a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, for the rest of you, stay smiling. Check out the show notes. If you liked this episode, please share with your friends, share with your loved ones, share with your parents. They're looking for ways to get healthier and younger. I'm going to see you on another episode. Stay smiling.